All right, welcome everyone. We are just giving it a few minutes to get started. Lots of things, lots of people are coming in. As you're joining, feel free to tell us where you're from. Um, we'd love to hear where you guys are located. You can just type it into the chat for us. One minute. We're about halfway through. Hey everyone. So tell us where you're from. We got someone from South Philly. I'm in Philadelphia too, but North Carolina. Boulder, Colorado. Philadelphia. There we go, California. We got people from all over. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome everyone to the webinar. We're just giving it just a couple of minutes, but I think we're gonna get started very shortly. Awesome. Center City Philly, great. All right, well, welcome everyone. I think we can probably get started just about now. All right, so welcome. It's glad to see everyone is from different parts of, it sounds like even Canada, which is exciting. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, we are from Think Company. Just real quick, I am Sela Tenenbaum. Um, I am a senior experience designer here at Think Company. Um, at Think, we are a technology and UX firm with locations in Philadelphia and Denver. And we help our clients achieve their business goals by improving the digital experience for their customers and employees. Um, so really, you know, in this current environment that we're all sort of in, um, this virtual experience, we've all seen how important digital experiences are for business continuity. We help our clients create world-class digital experiences. So if you're involved um, in helping your organization build or improve something with that goal in mind, let's definitely talk. Um, and you can find our contact info at thinkcompany.com or go to our, this URL that you're seeing on the screen um, and ask to start a conversation with one of our experts. And just a few, few housekeeping things before we dive into today's webinar. Um, we have a few upcoming events that are going on. So on October 15th, we're hosting a webinar on service design for voting. You can join John Young and Dan Singer. They're experienced election workers with UX and technology backgrounds. Um, join them for a discussion on how we can apply service design principles to the voting process. Um, from helping judges of elections manage their pre precincts to keeping lines short and voters informed, we'll explore ways to put voters at the center and build a better experience for all involved. Another event coming up on October 29th is modernizing a platform to democratize data with our very own Lizzie Manning and Craig Henderson from Policy Map. Policy Map is a tool that enables people to apply data to online maps in order to gain insights, insights on business community and policy issues. Um, we teamed up with them to design an innovative, to increase a design initiative to increase the performance of the policy map platform and to make it easier to access and digest data. So join us to learn more about that. And finally, we have on November 17th and 19th, our very own Dave Thomas will be holding a public version of our inclusive design workshop. Um, this workshop is intended to help organizations come up with systematic ways to mitigate bias in their design processes. These process, this process begins the acknowledgement that our users have biases, and so do we. Um, and it asks how we might use design and content strategy tools and methods to reduce the harm those biases can cause. All right, great. So a few ground rules before we get started in this webinar. So all of you have been muted by default. Um, we will be having a live Q&A at around 3.45 um, and we can extend this to go even a little bit beyond 4 p.m. Um, so if folks want to stick around, we can stay till about 4.30. Um, we ask that you post your questions within the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A when we get to that portion. So I will choose questions for the Q&A session. Um, if we select your question, we'll unmute you to introduce yourself and then ask your question to Dave and Ashley. Um, but if you want to remain anonymous, um, 
post your question anonymously by checking off that box in the Q&A panel and we'll ask it on your behalf. Um, and we may not get to all questions, um, but we do have moderators inside of chat and Q&A, so feel free to engage us there. And let's dive in. Um, so again, welcome. Without further delay, I'd like to officially kick off the discussion and welcome Ashley Turner and Dave Thomas for getting past the What We Do Now conversations in black and brown tech. So in recent months, there's been a large call for more just and equal rights for people of color in our country. And tech companies have been reflective of our own practices and thinking of ways we can contribute to building a more diverse tech workforce. We wanted to host this event today to learn from those in our industry who have knowledge and insights to share on this topic. And we're really excited to have Ashley here today to share her thoughts with us. Um, and now I'm gonna ha pass it over to Dave to kick off our conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Sayla. I'm really looking forward to this. Ashley and I have been having this conversation for I think a few, few months now. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe even longer, but more intensely over the last few months. <laughs> um, and uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is David Dylan Thomas. I am a content strategy advocate here at Think Company. And I'm also author of a book that just came out called Design for Cognitive Bias, which touches on some of the things I think we're going to talk about today. Uh, but without further ado, Ashley, I'll let you introduce yourself because you're into a few different things that I think are relevant here. So I'll let you kind of take the reins on that. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you both Dave and Think Company for inviting me to uh, speak with you all today. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ashley Turner. I'm an academic technologist at Swarthmore College. I'm also the founder of Philly Tech Sisters, an organization that encourages women of color to enter into the tech space by offering coding workshops. Um, and so this, this conversation, um, like Dave said, we've been talking about this for a while, and I'm just so glad to did I freeze? I can still see my, inter my internet is doing something weird. Sorry. Um, so I'm just so glad to further discuss this um, in the public platform so we can get some other thoughts and people involved in thinking uh, about these things as we move forward. Yeah. So I kind of want to start with you know what Sale was saying is true, right? We've, we've, we've started talking about this a lot. And what kind of happens, do you think, to sort of all the momentum we saw coming out of the protests this summer? Like, it seemed like people were suddenly paying a really close attention and corporations are playing close attention. And yet, I don't think we've seen much tangible progress. Like, what do you think happened there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, naturally movements have ebb and flows, you know. Um, there is a lot of frustration. And when we saw that video of George Floyd being quite frankly, murdered, you know, uh, with um, that police officer having his knee on his neck for almost eight minutes. I think that that just didn't feel right with anyone, right? So there was a lot of outrage <clears throat> regarding that. And we kind of got to see it firsthand. And that was very unsettling. So naturally, I think there was outrage <clears throat> and the riots and the statements came. But now I think that, you know, you can't stay, you can't always keep that momentum for so long. <clears throat> so sorry, I'm going to take a sip. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so naturally, I think that, you know, we don't see any public things being done right now necessarily, but sometimes you do have to slow down so you could speed up. I think right now people are in a phase of, allergies, sorry. <laughs> um, people are in a phase of planning um, more strategically maybe right now, at least that's the hope, right? So this isn't something that's going to uh, be solved within a couple of months. Um, it definitely is going to take a while. So it's a journey. So I don't think that <clears throat> you can always keep that momentum, but I do see a lot of people planning. People are trying to figure out what their next move is. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking that people are just slowing down to speed up. Um, we have seen some some uh, protests, you know, coming out of Portland for quite a while. Even <clears throat> that may have slowed up some. But I think that the we have to keep the momentum going, regardless if it's you know more outrage or if it's we're taking a step back to to really think about what our next move is going to be. 
Yeah, and 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 one of the one of the topics that we've been been discussing in in a word that's kept coming up in those discussions is exhaustion. Yeah. Um, and that that may play into the momentum bit, but like, what what sort of facets of this? Like, what does that word make you think of? What what sort of facets of this have been exhausting for you? I can you know talk about what's been for me, but yeah, I mean, for me, you know, as a as a black woman, it's exhausting to. <clears throat> see these same things happen over and over again where black and brown people are being killed by, uh, you know, police um, and things go to trial and then they get acquitted. And it's the same pattern that's happened time and time again. And um, it's exhausting to see that nothing happens as a result of this. Um, there are no consequences. It, at least it seems as, as though there aren't. And it does it just really <clears throat> doesn't seem like there's a lot of justice being served. It's also very triggering um, for black people because when you see those videos, you think to yourself, that could be one of my loved ones. It could be my brother, my father, um, or it could be me. I could be next. And so it's really triggering and exhausting to see this being played out over and over and over again and it's you know it's overwhelming and it sparks this sense of helplessness because there's there seems to be no one that could stop this you know with that george floyd video there were tons of people that were standing around and you know begging him to stop to get off of his neck people were videotaping, even the police officers with him, it, it seemed like there was nothing that anyone can do. And that evokes a sense of helplessness. And so it's, it's like, if no one can intervene, then what can be done? And so, you know, it just seems like it, we're the, we are the people, but no one is hearing us or listening to us. So it's very exhausting to watch. And it's triggering because it could be any one of our family members. And sometimes it has been, um, you know, family members. A lot of people have stories. So. Yeah, I think that, I think that's important to, I remember um, at some point during all of this, just walking down the street in Philly. Um, obviously, this was months ago when you could still walk down the street in Philly. But <laughs> when you could, um, I was just walking from, walking home from work one day and it just, I saw um, a white police officer across the street, just minding his own business. And the thought hit me like a freight train, just out of nowhere. That guy could kill me yeah. and nobody would stop him. And he, the worst he could worry about is a suspension. And just that cold, hard knowledge is something black people live with every day. And I bring that up just to sort of context and level set for like when we say we're exhausted, <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's an exhausting thing to live with, you know, and, and, and embody just in your everyday. In your everyday, it presents a sense of paranoia even, you know? What if someone, you know, if I get pulled over, will this be the end? Yeah. Um, you know, I forgot, I didn't say my goodbyes. You know, it's a real thought process and it's, exhausting to have to think about these things every time you get in your car or leave your house. You know, there have been so many stories, you know, we, we have our own groups, you know, networking groups or whatnot, where we share these stories. And some of them are really disparaging um, because it's, it's real for so many people. And I know that it seems so distant <clears throat> to, to others maybe because, you know, it's on the television. But it's it's very real for a lot of us. Yeah, I'm gonna use this one last analogy, then we'll, then we'll move on. But it just what you said, kind of about like, can I can I say goodbye to my loved ones? Kind of brought it home for me. Like an experience some people have had is being on a plane, and there's a little bit of turbulence, and then there's a little more turbulence, and then there's like a lot of turbulence, and just the little back of your head is like, oh crap, is this it? Imagine feeling like that 90% of the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That is, you know. <laughs> That's exhausting to have that level of anxiety. Yeah. You know, it, it wears on you. It wears on you mentally and physically. Um, lots of sleepless nights. Um, you know, when the riots were taking place in Philadelphia or early on, um, I live in West Philly. So what was happening really down the street from me, even though I wasn't there, 
But if I stepped outside, there was smoke in the air. I could hear helicopters. You know, I felt safe in my own home, of course, but I didn't get any sleep that night. You know, I didn't get any sleep for several nights after that, just thinking if something were to happen, what if someone just broke out, you know, and, you know, shots fired, anything could have happened. Um, and then what if I'm, you know, in the vicinity, are they going to mistake me, uh, you know, for breaking a window or something like that? You know, people get profiled all the time. Uh, there's been, you know, as of late, there's a video of a young man um, shopping who was um, pulled over or, you know, asked for his ID because he was jaywalking in Beverly Hills. Turns out this guy was a designer of Versace or something like that, but he was stopped and frisked and asked for his ID all because he was jaywalking. You know, he tried to explain to the officers, hey, I'm from New York City, jaywalking is a thing, you know, not that big a deal. But they, you know, completely roughed this guy up. And it's all because, because of what he was jaywalking, like, you know, you don't have anything else to do but to pull someone over or harass them for jaywalking. I, I think that's a problem. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things as you, as you try to change things, right. And you try to talk to people who potentially have the capacity to change things, the way they operate. Um, one of the things you inevitably run into is telling people things they might not want to hear. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and sort of like what it's like to sort of want to, you know, give your uh, opinion on a thing or your experience of a thing and just yeah. that, you know, inflexibility. Yeah, I think, I think, the human, you know, parts of ourselves, no one likes to be told what to do, right? You know? Um, so when you get approached uh, or asked for your advice or opinion, a lot of times, um, you know, you get presented with some defensiveness and that's natural. Um, but, you know, this is, this is something that is, it's a big issue and it's an uncomfortable issue. Um, and a lot of, you know, my black and brown friends have been approached um, lately because people are trying to solve this issue and, and rightfully so, right? Um, so, you know, being asked, well, what are your thoughts about if we do this DEI issue this way or that way? What are your, uh, or DEI initiative, what are your thoughts on this approach? Or what are your thoughts on, you know, the digital divide? Um, you know, people sometimes aren't in a place to hear the truth, you know, so they may pivot, you know, and deflect and go to a different conversation. Um, or they may say, yeah, that's, you know, okay, but, you know, what about this? Or, you know, they, they, they don't really listen to you. They kind of want to hear, you know, sometimes people are looking for, validation that they aren't doing um, the wrong thing, right? So they want to hear about the, the comfortable truth. But this is an uncomfortable conversation. And we just have to, um, we just have to get used to being in that un uncomfortable situation, right? Yeah. So a lot of times I've been approached and asked about different things. Uh, you know, about initiatives or programs that are trying to be put into place. And it just doesn't, the first conversation just doesn't always land well. You know, it may be, you know, I don't have the insight that they do, of course, because it's their company or the culture. Um, but I would say it's worth going into that conversation with, you know, just an open mind. Um, you know, you have to be open to different ways of thinking and approaching different things. And what you may think is, you know, minutia is really important to a black or brown person who is looking at your company thinking for a job or not. Um, so all these little bitty things add up to, to a lot. Yeah, and you, you talk about people don't like to be told what to do. People also don't like to be told that they're doing anything wrong or that they're, they're, yeah. they're, that, that, and I feel like there's two kind of warring instincts when, when people ask me about like stuff like this. And one is an instinct where what they're really asking is, please tell me I'm not a racist.
is understanding that there is a systemic problem, which they have benefited from, and they want to actually fix the problem. So it's the difference between this internal focus of, well, I want to come out of this feeling good about myself to this external focus of, well, we got to fix this. No matter how it looks for me, I have this, this needs fixing. And it's a spectrum, but like you can tell, right? Yeah. Where people are leaning, right? As you talk to them. <laughs> Absolutely. And if it's, if it's your company or your business, right? It's really hard to separate the two, you know, to separate yourself from the company yeah. because you may have built this thing, right? So it just, you know, that's why I really love the book, White Fragility because she comes out the gate saying, just let's just ground floor and say, we're all racist. Let's just get past that part. We're all racist or we all have bias, right? Every single one of us has bias. Let's just let that be the floor. And now we can move on. So you don't have to get defensive, right? You don't have to say, oh, you know, I need your, you know, you to tell me that I'm not a racist or the excuse that, you know, I have, black friends, you know, we've, all, we've heard that one, right? You know, like my, my grandchildren are black or whatever. And you know, that, that doesn't mean you don't have bias. We all have bias, right? So um, when you go into these conversations, when you're looking for solutions, keep that in mind, keep an open mind. It's not a, um, the hard truths aren't a dig on your personality or you personally. It's just, they're just really uncomfortable truths. And it, it takes some reflection, uh, reflection and, and just, you know, analyzation of what is really taking place and what's going on. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think ties into all of this is all these sort of attempts people have made. Um, I'll, I'll call them well-meaning folks <laughs> have made <laughs> to sort of, you know, make progress. Right. And, but I feel like, each of these efforts in one way or another is sort of missing something. And, and I'm curious, like what you're in the ones you've experienced, like what, what do you feel like has been missing um, in these attempts? Yeah. So a couple of things, um, they are well-meaning attempts and um, a, a lot of, a lot of them are commendable, right? Cause this is a hard thing to tackle. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I see that is missing is uh, the research an inventory of what has already taken place, what the status quo is, you know, amongst your employees or your work environment, your culture, um, your data, right? Uh, taking and analyzing your data and saying, you know, where are our own problems? Where, you know, where do we see pockets of improvement or opportunities, right? So that's one issue. People, um, just want to quickly move to the solution. So when, you know, you get asked your opinion or your advice, um, you know, like, what can we do? What can we do now? And it's like, well, have, where have you started? Where have you come from? Have you analyzed and taken stock of what's going on currently in order for you to make decisions about where you move forward? And the other thing that I see that, that people often miss, quite frankly, the action. Like the action <clears throat> is now on you to figure out, you know, what this solution is going to look like at your company, right? You know, there is a time for uh, research and data and everything like that, um, but then there's the action, how we move forward. And, um, you know, with anything, sometimes, yeah, starting small is, is, is good. You know, it's okay if you start out small, right? Um, but in action, makes things worse, right? So you have to put in the action. Really, it boils down to implementation. Who are you going to put into place to implement these changes that you want to happen, right? So we, we know things need to change. We want our teams to be more diverse. We want the leadership to be more diverse. How are you going to implement these changes? implementation is the biggest thing that I see that gets missed. Mm. I mean, it's funny too, because that the world I inhabit in sort of user experience um, and that you inhabit too, um, it is a chronic problem of having to convince stakeholders to, to do the work, to do the research. Yes. Right? And it's a chronic problem to get them to, once they've done the research to actually make fundamental change, like systemic yes. change. 
Um, so it's funny that those struggles still persist, even when we're talking about race. Still persist. And it's not going to take one person, you know, so like the whoever is your diversity, equity, inclusion officer or chief or something like that, the onus shouldn't be on that one person. You need an implementation team, right? Just like how you tackle anything else, a product or a service. You have a team of people working to implement those things, right? And you need a team of people, of very diverse people, and not just, you know, the diversity that we see, you know, not just race and gender, but you need background diversity, department diversity, right? Um, cognition diversity, ability diversity. You need all of those to build up a team that could tackle this because they're each one are gonna bring the different perspectives, right? So that's how, and you come up with a strategic plan. Um, and it's, it's nothing is going to be a one-time fix. So implicit bias training isn't going to be a one-time fix or sensitivity training or whatever you want to call it. That's not going to be a, the, the silver bullet. It's going to have to be a multi-year um, strategic plan with going forward. And implementation is key. Who are you going to put into place to do that? Yeah. So it's a, it's a content strategist, I'm like, I feel you. Um, <laughs> uh, Have a content strategist on your team, right? Oh, yeah, Have communications, yeah. marketing, because <laughs> a lot of this is boils down to the message, right? So if you have this team of people, um, how are you going to convince the rest of the company, the rest of the team? You know, sometimes these things happen from the bottom up, and sometimes they happen from the top down. So if you're starting from the bottom up, how are you going to convince your CEO, right? You need that communications person to kind of put it in a package and make it make sense, right? So you need all different types of people to help you with implementing. Yeah. Um, moving from like asking others for help or sort of moving toward positions of power and trying to get them to change. Let's talk a little bit about um, what it looks like for black and brown folks to take the reins on making progress themselves. And like, what are we able to do that, you know, doesn't rely on sort of the well-meaning folks. Um, yeah. And why it might not be the best idea to only rely on the well-meaning folks. Yeah, the well-meaning folks are great, right? Um, but because in this society, right, what is often seen is this idea of like black struggle, right? Like we yeah. are bombarded with all these videos of black and brown people being beaten and killed, you know, at the hands of our police officers. And, um, you know, the idea of the welfare queen and the struggle, right? So um, there are these disparaging numbers and statistics about, you know, us and how we've been affected by COVID and all these other um, diseases, uh, chronic diseases and things like that. So we're bombarded with all this, these negative images and about the struggle and how we are downtrodden, right? Um, so naturally, the well-meaning folks come to us and say, well, how can we, you know, help, you know, these downtrodden people or this, uh, these statistics, how, you know, how can we make them better or how can we improve, which is great. It, it's a great question. Why wouldn't you want to try to solve, you know, that question, right? But it also means that they, the well-meaning folks, are creating the narrative. So if the narrative is always downtrodden struggle, then how do we move, how do we ever move past that? So if the idea that I've really been uh, struggling with is how do black people or black and brown people take back the narrative? Because we're not all struggling, right? Yes, walking, um, you know, being pulled over by a police officer your life may flash before you, you know, because you may be thinking like this could be the end, but it's, that's not um, every moment. There are joys in life that we all experience, whether it, you know, you hit the goal, you know, with your project or, you know, you um, celebrating an anniversary, anything, right? There are other things in life as well. Um, so if we could begin to have more control of our own narratives, because just like any other culture, there are many, we have many different experiences. And if there could be more influence 
with the different types of experiences that we all have that don't always involve struggle, I think that we could begin to kind of get, you know, get out of this struggle story. You know, that's one story, right? What are the other stories? You know, um, there's so many things. It's just like everyone else, right? Like you bought a new car or you got a promotion. Um, you, you published your book, you know, like, hello, that's a joyous story, something that's to be celebrated, right? And no, you're not Barack Obama, but publishing a book, like who, you know, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment. So there's other stories out there to be told. And I think that as black and brown people, if we could get a hold of some of those stories, um, and put them out into the media more, I think that we can have some variety and some control of how we are viewed. Because when you watch those videos online, you know, people come up to you or people may look at you and they think, you know, that that's going to happen to you. Or, you know, you could be the person, um, you know, doing vandalizing or um, looting or something like that. They think because that's who they show on those videos or black and brown people doing the looting, even though it's not just black and brown people, right? But they think that, oh, you know, you fit the description. That's where, the, that's where that term comes in, right? You fit the description. And so how can we start changing some of those narratives and taking control over our own stories? Yeah, just as a side note on that, I was, there was a wonderful like little video going around early on in the protest of like some purple black folks standing on the corner and there's like these bricks that just suspiciously appeared on the sidewalk that weren't there the day before. And it's sort of like, huh, I wonder who put those there and what they expected us to do with them. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I'm glad you brought that because that was definitely something I wanted to hit on is this notion of black joy yeah. because I think you're right. I think that there is a narrative that we have not been able to control. And I think that what happens, like the best case scenario with that suffering narrative is the moment I think we're having now is a moment where a lot more people than used to are starting to realize that they owe black America something, mm. right? That, that's something that, that there is this great injustice and there is like a debt right? And that's, you know, that's good. I'd rather you think that than think it's okay to kill us. Right. But, but what that sets up is like, it's the same way I'm going to feel about someone I owe money. Like if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody I owe money, I'm going to go in a store, <laughs> right? I'm going yeah, to hide I'm gonna I'm gonna feel uncomfortable around that person. If on the other hand, I'm walking down the street and I see my friend, my brother who I love, I'm going to run across the street and be like, Hey, how's it going? How you been? Right? Right. I want us to get to the point where people love black people. Yeah. rather than just pity them or fear them or like get guilty around them, right? Like that's, right. that's the arc I would like to see happen because that then you start to have that, that story of black joy. I want people to, to look at black and see beauty. Um, mm -hmm. I just finished literally last or night before I finished Black is King. Have you seen this? Uh, no. Beyonce. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> it's, I have basically, to watch it. it's basically an hour and a half ad for blackness. It's, it's, wow. it's fantastic. It's just sort of like, this is how amazing yeah. blackness is for an hour and a half with Beyonce music, just in luxury. I've heard about it. <laughs> yeah, that, it's, it's, I, that's it's, what I want people absorbing. Right. Depiction of black joy, right? More of that. More of that. Yeah. I could definitely relate to that. Um, you know, my question is, how can we normalize you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. How can we normalize um, black joy, right? You know, we don't, we're not necessarily asking for Beyonce to put out an hour and a half video every month, right? But how can we just see normal folks, yeah. normal black and brown folks experiencing joy? You know, um, I think that's one of the major questions that I'm just trying to figure out. Like, we need to figure out different ways to take back our stories, start telling our own narratives because they're all very different um, to spread more of that. That way it won't feel so heavy, right? Like the, you won't be trying to avoid the tax collector, you know, or avoid this conversation because you don't know, you don't want to fear 
that you'll be called or thought of as a racist or I owe you some sort of debt. Like, that's ridiculous, you know? So, yeah, definitely. Um, we're going to jump to the questions in a sec, but I, I, I definitely want to go a little further with this taking the reins discussion. Like, what does that look like for Black and brown yeah. folks to really start to own the process of fixing Black and brown tech ourselves? Right. So... I think we're really going to have to think about different ways that we could collaborate, right? Mm -hmm. um, collaboration is a kind of really taboo subject within our community. It's really hard to do. It's been proven hard to do, and for various reasons. And I know this is going to sound cliche, but a little bit of it is because it goes back to slavery, right? During yeah. slavery, we were pitted against each other, right, within our own communities. You know, they divided us between house slaves and field slaves and they pulled the men away from our families <clears throat> so there's a lot that gets passed down over the generations that we still have to deal with and <clears throat> because of that it's hard for us to get together and try to build but I think we are definitely going to have to start thinking about different ways that we could combat that particular narrative that's been passed on through generations because it's imp it's just critical that we begin to take back our own narrative our own stories because otherwise people are going to tell the stories for us and mm -hmm. it's not going to be true so yeah. i think you know we have to find different ways that's going to work for for us right some of those ways <clears throat> you know might not involve things like money or anything like that because there is some distrust there, right? But what are some things that we can do? We can come together and support each other in various ways. You know, like I said, this time has been really overwhelming for a lot of us to watch all these videos, right? So how are we doing mentally? How are we doing physically? Let's get together and talk about it. How can we help each other? Because if you're always asking, you know, for someone else to solve the problem, they're not going to solve the problem the way you think it should be naturally, right? How can we contribute collectively to solve this issue? And I think it's going to have to be us getting together and breaking down some of our own boundaries um, so we can move forward with our own stories. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think that... Just a couple of like quick examples of that. So I think you and I talked about the, um, the Black Doctors Consortium. I wonder if you could tell that story, because just as an example of what it looks like when Black folks can get together and get something done. Yeah, so when, you know, the beautiful thing that happened uh, from COVID-19, um, the Black Doctors Consortium came together. And it's a consortium of, you know, several Black doctors who went out and put together testing sites you know, that reach, you know, um, black and brown people and the frontline workers, right? So they put together their resources because at the beginning, there wasn't a lot of testing centers. It was, it was very hard to be tested um, and things like that. So they put everything aside and they, you know, took time out to pull together their resources to help black and brown people because they saw what was happening and they acted quickly. You know, sometimes it's not going to always be, you know, a quick reaction, right? But you can do things incrementally. And it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. You know, can you get together with your group of friends and, you know, just have a, a support group? Um, you know, you know, talk about, you know, uh, or a small wins group. Get together and talk about yeah. your small wins, right, to bring back that black joy. What happened? You know, um, well, what happened with you at work this week? You know, um, I completed a project. Um, you know, I, I got my blog post done. You know, it's all sorts of things that you could celebrate in small groups. Um, and it's really great because right now a lot of us are isolated. We're in, um, you know, isolation from each other because of the pandemic. We're away from our families or, you know, we're by ourselves, some of us. And so to have those support groups put into place where we could just talk and relax and just kind of vent, that goes such a long way. So that may be one way for us to get together collectively. 
if you could do more, do more. You know, meet people in the middle. Um, I have a good friend that always tells me, because I get, you know, just like anyone else, you get overwhelmed with all the things you have to do for work and for home and for family. And, you know, sometimes you can ask yourself, well, where do I start? There's so much that has to be done. And she always tells me, start where you start. Start where you start right now, right here. What does that look like for you? What can you do right now? So start where you start. That's great advice. Um, I want to make sure we leave some time for questions. Sayla, do we have any questions yet? Can you see me? Now I'm here. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, no, they can't see me. Um, we do have some questions. Um, I'm just going to take a look here. I will say we are we are seeing some comments, but there is still time, actually, if you want to um, type in there and ask a question um, and even upload each other's questions, and then we can try to prioritize that so we have time to answer as much as we can. Um, so our first question comes from Nicholas K. Um, if you don't mind, since you identified yourself, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question to Ashley and Dave. Um, so go right ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, I just want to say the talk has been really good so far, so I really appreciate this um, and like you guys showing up and, and the conversation. It's been really insightful. So like the question I wanted to ask is um, what are like important but harmful narratives that within tech and design that you personally feel like need to be redressed? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest myths that is out there is that there is this pipeline issue, right? I know, right? It's laughable. There is this, there, there are no, you know, companies often say, well, we want to hire black and brown candidates, but we don't know where they are. They aren't qualified. Um, there are not a lot of qualified candidates for this type of role. Um, and we, we all know that that's a myth. Right there, even and this has been a myth that has been put out there for a very long time, and even today, uh, this day and age, this is still being an issue. Uh, just either last week or a couple of weeks ago, you know, the person from a very large bank, you know, was on a call. You all may have heard about this. You can Google it if you want. Um, but he mentioned that you know the pool for you know black and brown people are, is small. So we we're having trouble, and I'm paraphrasing, we're having trouble filling these roles with diverse candidates, right? So this, this pipeline myth, it, it's a myth. There are tons of black and brown candidates um, out there that are qualified, overqualified, quite frankly, um, to fill positions in tech and, and beyond. Um, just like with anything else, you have to, sometimes you have to go where they are. You know, they might not be in the same places that you are naturally, um, or that, you know, the company would initially think to go. Um, so you have to find them, just like if they were a product or a service. If you created, you know, something that, you know, you wanted uh, seniors to use, where would you go first? Would you go to a nursing home or assisted living place to get some data and question some people? Absolutely. Why wouldn't you do the same when you're looking for diverse candidates, right? There are tons of companies out there that have pools of diverse candidates that target diverse candidates. You could, you know, link up with them, collaborate with them um, to get your job descriptions out there, right? So, and there are things that you could do to change, uh, to attract uh, diverse candidates if you change some of the things within your job description. So there's, there's tons of stuff um, out there that really defeats that myth. Yeah, and, and, and to bounce off of that, the other myth that I think we really need to put to bed is the idea of culture fit. So mm -hmm. even once you get that person through that pipeline, <laughs> once they arrive, we were finding lots of black and brown folks dropping out of tech because they, they find that there's no home for them there. Yeah. And if a company thinks in terms of, I need to find someone who fits our culture, 
it sounds good at first, especially if you think you've got a great culture, but by <laughs> its very definition, it will create a monoculture because you're just looking for pieces that fit. Yeah. A great uh, analogy I heard uh, alternative is culture growth, right? Mm. Which is to say, I'm not looking for someone who's going to help us stay the same. I'm going to look for someone who's going to change us for the better, right? And yeah. if that's your approach, okay, A, I have even more imperative now to look in places I haven't looked before, <laughs> because if I just keep looking in the places I've looked, I'm just going to keep getting the same stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. And B, once that person arrives, right, I will have already implemented the means for them to change us, right? Not, hey, here's your desk and here's how you be just like us. It's like, hey, here are the gears and the shifts that change what our company does. Have at it right? <laughs> Come here and change us. That is a very different message, but it's much more welcoming. It's much more likely someone who's coming from a different point of view can find a home there. If instead you're saying, oh, great, you're here now, assimilate, right? Yeah. Totally. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks, Nicholas. All right. So we're going to take another question. This was posted anonymously, so I'm going to go ahead and read it for them. Um, what do you see as the most important action for companies in the tech industry to take right now? Are formal DEI initiatives a good start, or is there something more that you'd recommend? I think that right now, like I said earlier, we all want to fix this issue. There's a sense of urgency right now, and rightfully so. But I really think that it's going to take strategic planning to tackle it. And it's going to be incremental change that's going to change it, right? So come up with a plan, you know, a multi-year plan, you know, like we do everything else. <clears throat> What's your one-year plan? What's your five-year, 10-year? You approach it the same way you do products and services. Come up with a strategic plan, starting with your analysis and research, your data, and build it out from there. <clears throat> the, the other approach um, that we've talked about uh, when thinking about this subject is do uh, approach it with backwards design in mind, right? Design from the end. Think, you know, maybe do a design exercise um, where you map out what success looks like for your company or your community, right? What does success look like for you? Do you want 30% diverse uh, candidates? Do you want 20% diverse executive team leaders? Um, you know, map all that out, reverse engineer. That's what we're good at in tech, right? We reverse engineer everything. I really don't understand why we can't approach DEI the same way. Reverse engineer it. Start with the end in mind and then build back. And then iterate, iterate, iterate. You know, like every year, you know, there are tons of people that have been working on this before, you know, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, right? So, but if you've been working on it before and then, you know, this, this pandemic happens and these riots or, uh, you know, um, I don't want to call, keep calling them riot, protests happens, um, you know, how do you change? How do you pivot? It would be the same with any product. Dove is a great example of that. You know, they came out with that commercial where they wanted to show an example of how if you use your soap, you come out clean, I guess. But they started out with a black woman and they ended, you know, as people kept taking their shirts off, they ended with a white woman. It was horrible, right? So they had, they, they learned their lesson, but they had to pivot and start taking inventory and change the message. Like that was not their intent, of course not, you know, but they had to change. So when things happen in the world or society or your company, then you have to change up the approach, um, just like you would with any other product. So they changed their messaging. And as a result, you know, they have a really great diverse group of products right now. You know, they have different hair care products for different types of hair. I mean, they've done a complete 180 and it's, it's, it's pretty exemplary. So, you know, take notes. Yeah. And the, and I'm going to, I want to circle back to the, the, what does success look like? Cause we actually kind of promised to answer, ask that, answer that. But, um, <laughs> but the, the other thing I think you should do, is, is to scare yourself a little bit, right? And to ask yourself, like, what are you prepared to do? Just like the untouchables, what are you prepared to do? Um, <laughs> and ask, and, and, and this goes back to the research we were talking before. We've already done lots of research on what 
actions, what policies have been seen to move the needle, especially around gender disparity, mm-hmm. but pay disparity in general, right? Or for hiring. And there's two things you can do that we already know strongly move the needle. One is um, posting the um, dollar, like non-negotiation posting. If, the, if you're posting a job, say how much you're going to pay. Yeah. That alone moves the needle on that pipeline issue, right? Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is salary transparency. That has also been shown to strongly move the needle, right? So this is not to say your company is prepared to do that, but right. these are questions you, since you know the research tells you they're going to move the needle, that is a discussion you should have is to say, okay, this far and no further, like what are we actually prepared to do or what steps, what incremental iterative steps are we ready to take that will get us to the point where we can do these things that we already know scientifically <laughs> are going to move the needle on our pipeline and on our, our um, gender disparity, on our, on, our, on our pay disparities. So that's another thing I think you should do is sort of like maybe scare yourself a little and say like, oh, I mean, we already know that works. Are we prepared to do that? And, that, and that's a question you have to be asking at the highest level. Like that, that is a C-suite question, right? Because th- that's who has to make that decision ultimately. But I would say at least engage in that exercise. So you're not fooling yourself. You know what I mean? In terms of what you're prepared to do or to attach this point with incremental steps you're ready to take and where that's going. But I do, I do want to make sure because I'm always, we never actually answered the question or even asked what does success look like? And that's kind of in the title. And I'm curious. So Ashley, what is your sort of like gut on what does success look like? Like we're saying all this stuff, we got to fix this. Well, what, is, what does it look like when it's fixed? Yeah. So a couple things. Um, what success looks like is when you take into account the entire employees or team members journey, right? From when they are looking at the job description, in the interview, get the job, a part of the team, you know, learning the job, there for a couple of years, progressing through the job, really gr- getting into the culture, um, being a team leader, um, being promoted, you know, the, uh, the whole, like you would approach the customer journey, right? What is the employee journey? And then having a number or, you know, what that looks like, not for just, you know, the one person that you may hire, right? Or the token, but how many people do you want to hire? How many, what's the, put a number or some sort of framework around it, right? And then the ultimate success would be for us to, to be honestly, to not have to do this, right? For this to be like normal, for this to be normalized, um, normalized in the way of thinking about diversity and equity and inclusion and what that looks like. When it's just, we don't have to think and question, it's just put into all of the practices all along the way from, you know, from start to finish, when it's become absolutely normalized. And the way I think we're going to have to do that is by um, painting a picture, painting that picture first. You know, you and I have talked about this concept called speculative fiction, right? Yeah. And speculative fiction, uh, speculative fiction is this idea, kind of like what you said to kind of scare yourself a little bit. It, um, it's this theory that kind of allows you to paint an alternative picture of what you know, cultural norms may look like to evoke debate, discussion, um, and kind of scare you a little bit, right? And we see this happen in a lot of movies and TV shows. One, uh, for instance, is Black Mirror, you know, where you see like the technology takes over and we're all robots and they consume us. That scares you a little bit, right? So it makes you think about how, how not to abuse technology because we know the past that we can go down if we abuse technology. Do the same thing when it comes to diversity, right? Maybe paint the picture, oh my God, if we were just 100%, you know, white males, you know, what would that look like? How would we abuse, you know, tech culture? Maybe get scared a little bit like, oh my gosh, you know, like we definitely don't want to go that down that path. So choose another path. But I really think that painting that picture, visualizing, what diversity, equity, and inclusion looks like in your company, your community, or your family, business, whatever you want to put into place, create a visualization of it and work backwards from there. That is how you reach success, in my opinion. 
Yeah, and, I, and I, I'm glad we got to touch on that speculative fiction part, because I think that also goes back to the Black Joy thing, too, and that whole idea of narrative and, like, controlling that narrative, because we want to paint a picture that everybody can look at and say, like, yeah, that's what it looks like. It's hard to only act when you know what's wrong, right? Yeah. It's hard to only act when you know what the bad outcome is. It's better to sort of have a vision for what you're shooting for. It's, like, way easier to get there if you actually know what it looks like. And I feel right. like the flip side of the sort of, like, um, like uh, negative speculative fiction that you're gonna get from Black Mirror is something like, um, like Black Panther, right? Where it's yeah. like, I'm gonna pause it. Like, and it's basically all it is. And it's again, it's something that we, as designers at least, are used to. And, as, and it's answering the question, what if? So Black Panther says, what if there was an African country that had never been colonized and had access to, um, to an incredibly powerful natural resource and just mm-hmm. play that out over centuries? What would, that, what would, what would happen? Right, and yeah. you get this whole vision for what like a black utopia looks like. And it's like, okay, that. Well, I'll have some of that, please, right? Yes, um, that is black joy, yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so I feel like there are similar questions. Like you can sort of say, well, what if for a year we pay- paid our black and brown employees twice as much as we paid our uh, non-black and brown employees? What would happen? Or if we what would happen really twice as much as men for a year? What would happen? Like, right. and it's just speculate and sort of tell that story. And sometimes we'll be like, oh, that would actually be a lot better, right? (laughs) And sometimes, frankly, a lot better for everybody. That's the other thing I think people get afraid of, especially Mm -hmm. as we go back to that privilege discussion. It's like, oh, I've had it really good. If we go to equal, that means I actually have to lose some stuff, right? (laughs) And it's like, okay, but maybe it's not that bad. (laughs) Maybe it's actually better. Maybe you don't even like all that extra stuff you've got. Maybe you're not actually using it, you know? (laughs) Right. So I, I, but, I, but I agree. The, way the names, you know, names and uh, pictures from, you know, job applications and things like that. What if you took all the unnecessary stuff that told you about the person's demographic and you just looked at their accomplishments? What if, you know, what if that happened? So I would, you know, really encourage people to start asking, what if, what if, how might we, you know, yeah. question, question the narrative. Absolutely. I love this conversation. I think it fits into this next um, question that we have from um, Neha Agrawal because we have two Neha A's. So I'm going to actually unmute you, Neha, and you can ask your question. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again, Ashley and Dave, for the conversation. It's really great. Um, This is perhaps a typical question, but I ask it a lot because quite frankly, I don't feel like many people can answer it. Um, So I'm just curious, it's okay if you can't too, but um, are there any organizations, whether they be in tech or otherwise that you think are doing DEI work effectively? And if so, what what do you think is making that work effective? Definitely. Um, There are organizations already doing this. and they've been doing it for a while. I know that um, I've worked with some organizations that have uh, apprenticeship programs put into place, and they've been uh, very helpful with job placement and things like that. Um, I was just on a call where this uh, insurance company told their story about how they approach DEI at their at their job, and how that they you know came up with this advisory board and how they approached, you know, who got to be up on the advisory board and how the CEO uh, was a part of their monthly meetings and they had subcommittees. This person just broke it all the way down and it, it sound really amazing. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of companies out there already doing it. I think the name of that company was Protect Life. I could look it up and send it or put it in the um, in a blog post. Um, but um there, there are lots of companies that are already doing uh, great work. And um, I think it's worth some of the, their practices emulating. Um, there's three things that come to mind. And it, these are varying takes on what is meant by DEI work. But uh, there's the Design Justice Network, who is sort of tackling what equality mean, and equity means at the level of the entire industry. Um, and if you just Google Design Justice Network 10 principles, Like you will think you're reading like a political manifesto and you are because design is political. Like that's, that's a tenant, like they get that. And so a lot of their work is sort of around um, doing design work that does not um, keep uh, injustice going. 
like there's this whole conversation now around how does traditional design thinking actually propagate white supremacy? That's the kind of stuff they're taking on. Um, yep. So there's that at sort of like the systemic industry level. At the very practical, let's get some people some jobs level, um, there's HopeWorks, who specifically works with uh, folks who are just out of prison, right? Who are just, you know, kids, like who dropped out of school. And, um, and what makes them work is that they look at the whole person, right? They aren't just saying, okay, we're going to offer you some programs and some training. It's like, okay, first we're going to pay you because we know you need money. And like, if you're spending time here, you're not making money. So we'll take care of that. Oh, and we're also going to make sure that things like food security are addressed. Like they're just going to figure out all what your deal is, right? And what actually you, you need to even be able to function, right? Um, so they take that into account every day as part of the program. And I think that makes them like twice as effective as just, okay, we're gonna teach you some stuff and good luck. Um, and then the final one, what was the other one I wanted to make sure I talked about? Um, Design justice, uh, hope works. Oh, um, it's a small but important thing, but the UX and content Slack, or, or maybe it's called content and UX Slack. It's a huge, like almost 10,000 people on it. Um, and there, there's a lot of great elements to it. Like there's a great anti-racist thread, language thread and, and inclusivity thread. But one of the things they do that I absolutely admire, they have a job board and that job board, you are not allowed to post anything to that job board unless you actually say how much that job pays. Mm. Like that's just ground rules, which means if you are someone who wants to look for a job and wants to know how much <laughs> they're going to get paid and doesn't want to go through a bunch of bull around like negotiations, that's, there's a whole bunch of jobs and there's new ones every day. So, and that's like one piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece, right? So I think, and I think that is also part of it. It's like, I don't know any one organization that's doing everything, but I know a lot of organizations that are doing one thing really well. Yeah. Yeah, it goes back to starting where you are, right? Um, when you said the Slack channel, that made me think of We Evolve. Yeah. Who, as a result of, you know, the, um, the disparity, you know, with the death of George Floyd and the uh, protests, they, you know, wanted to spring into action themselves. So they started taking uh, an hour or so out of their weekly day to set aside what they call workable action time, or I'm paraphrasing what it's really called. But, you know, people join on a Zoom call to take action, you know, whether that's reading a book or writing your senator, um, you know, they're just taking that, carving that time out to focus on this one thing. And so that's the, you know, that's one thing that they could do. Um, they're, they're doing other things, like, like Dave said, a lot of companies are doing little bitty things that can help contribute. And that makes, that makes up for a lot. It makes a big deal. Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Neha. All right, so we're gonna go to another question that was posted anonymously. Um, so I'm going to read it. Um, we all know, and this person hopes, that it isn't the job of only underrepresented and marginalized folks to educate about DEI and to do the work. However, these are the folks that often show up to do the work in companies. How do we, how do companies motivate those in the majority to get involved in the work? I think that, that's, thank you for bringing that up because that's another um, myth um, that, that, it ties into, you know, what people think about. It ties into that narrative of we all have to be able to tackle, know how to tackle this problem. I am not a DEI expert. You know, I can speak to you about my experience as a Black woman, but that's everyone has a different experience, right? So the people, the Black and Brown people at your job, they may, you know, they may have their own experience, but they don't, they may not necessarily have the experience of presenting that to a CEO, right, or interacting with other people in the company and leading those discussions. So I think that it's, it's worth it to go out and seek those consultants, you know, the people that actually do the work and pay them, you know, that goes, that ties into equity, pay people to come in and help you fix this problem because you would pay anyone else to do that. So the onus should not be on just the black and brown employees. Um, and it takes a collective effort, right? So um, I was like, I mentioned this insurance company, I, I wrote it down and it's called Protective Life. And what they did is, you know, after they um, did, you know, some research and some user um, interviews, um, just within their own company, um, 
they that gave them some insight and then they allow people to apply to be a part of the advisory board right this is just one way but they sent out a call like saying hey we know a lot of people this is something that means a lot to a lot of different people and we know people want to get involved if you want to get involved in this you know effort uh, to improve diversity equity inclusion then you know there's the application and you could just let us know <clears throat> why you want to get involved and that helped, you know, them gain some perspective and it helped people articulate why they want to get involved um, and if they have the capacity to do so. So that was just one way of selecting people to be a part of the solution to help move things forward. Yeah, I had this other sort of question to sort of build off of that one about just really about how to better foster curiosity. I almost feel like that was like sort of what this question was maybe trying to get at also, but I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but um, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that, both of you. <clears throat> Dave, I don't know if you want to go, but it, this just reminds me of the whole speculative fiction thing. I was going to say, yeah, buy me some time while I think about that one, because I, I, oh, I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think that really um, going through different you know, uh, design exercises, right? Mm -hmm. Where you create or think about <clears throat> a, a scenario that is alternative to what is happening now and kind of create a story. You know, storytelling is, an, is a tradition, right? You know, we all think like, oh, stories are for children and whatever, but really we tell ourselves stories every day. And the story you tell about your job, you know, the story you tell about how you built your business, um, that's a story. And so I think that we could have conversations around what is the story that we want to tell, right, about how the culture is at our job. Um, can we build, what can we build out from that story? That helps spark, you know, just different alternatives because, like I said, with the images that we get from the media. Right now we have one narrative and that's the story that we all know. Like there's a huge digital divide <clears throat> and all of this struggle. How can we break out of that narrative? And I, I think that if you practice some, um, you know, design thinking exercises, I think that can help build out that story that you want to tell. Yeah, and I, it's interesting. It's like I, I wonder if the, the the reason I have difficulty answering the question "How do you make people curious?" is that I feel like I'm naturally curious. I'm like I'm just there. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how y'all got there. I'm I'm already here. But <laughs> but I, what it what it puts me in mind of though is a sort of approach to education um, called the it's called the Big Questions curriculum. And instead of saying, okay, today we're going to learn why the sky is blue, and we're going to pull out these science books, and we're going to read this stuff, and you're going to memorize these facts. Instead, it says, okay. Everybody break into groups. I want you to figure out why the sky is blue. <laughs> Come back to me in a week. <laughs> tell me why the sky is blue. Why do you, you know, tell, you know, and I'll give you access to all the information you need, but you figure it out, right? And I, and I imagine taking that to, to like history and sort of saying like, okay, you see how the, the Washington Monument changes color suddenly, like about halfway up? Tell me, tell me why that is. Go figure it out, <laughs> right? And you will quickly learn. It's a very complicated answer, but it does totally involve why part of it is built by slaves and part of it isn't. That's mm -hmm. totally a part of that story, right? So I'm kind of sneaking in a little history there, but, but, I, but I agree, like it, the, the, I think we have many, I, I think it's more, my supposition is that we were born curious. We kind of get it trained out of us, but we are all naturally curious and it's more about how do I get things out of your way so you can indulge that curiosity? So when it comes to that uncomfortable conversation where I'd rather you be curious uh, when you, you know, are, are engaging with discussions about race and the defensive, I need to sort of get past those defenses and sort of be like, okay, we're going to agree, like, kind of like, we're going to agree for the next hour that everybody in this room is racist. Like, that, that's not the question. The question we're going to answer in this room is not, who's the most racist? That's not, we're, that's not the contest here. <laughs> the question we're going to answer is, you know, why is it that, you know, um, white families have twice as much wealth as black families? Like, and again, just figure it out. You can, it, it's actually not that, you can, you can think you can, right? But now it's a curiosity thing. It's like, it's not, it's not me saying, oh, you, 
Bob, you're the reason that white families are making choices. Like, no, that's, that's not the answer. It's like, no, let's just figure this out. So I feel like that kind of approach is probably, it's more about bringing up the curiosity that's already there, but maybe you're not engaging with it because you're scared. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, when I first met you, it was through your content strategy workshop. And you recommended that, you know, when we're approaching content strategy, that we ask why, that we always ask why. And then just keep, you know, once someone gives you an answer, just ask why again. And you just keep asking why. And that sparks that curiosity naturally. That is absolutely true. Thank you for answering that on my behalf, honestly. Um, <laughs> how are you guys feeling on time? I know we've gone over all, almost like 12 minutes. Um, we could keep going. We could kind of start wrapping things up. I'm good. Yeah, there are more questions. Yeah. Let's ask. All right, let's do it. All right, so we have a question. Um, I might pronounce your name wrong, and I apologize for that. Um, Mayada C. I'm going to unmute you if you wouldn't mind going ahead and asking your question, um, go right ahead. Hey, uh, and actually you did pronounce my name right, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so I, something I've noticed, it's kind of echoing some things that you've already talked about, but um, when companies talk about hiring black and brown employees or diverse employees, it's really framed as like, we went looking for people and we couldn't find them. And it's not really like, there's not a lot of introspection of, well, what am I doing as a company to make myself more attractive mm. to having diverse black and brown employees want to come and work for me? Um, and I feel like, you know, there's things of, oh, it'll be more attractive. We put like beer in the fridge. <laughs> like there's those conversations that happen. But so the, why aren't there conversations happening about, okay, well, what would make somebody want to come work for us? Mm -hmm. So like, what are things that companies could do to make themselves, like make their culture and their workspace more attractive to black and brown prospective employees? That's a good point to start within. You know, if you, um, if your leadership team is, you know, Think in one note, you know, like everybody looks the same. Evaluate that and ask yourself why, right? Do you have employees within the company already that you could work on helping them get promotions to be a part of the leadership team or executive board, right? Um, make those internal changes so that, you know, we're all visual, you know, a lot of people are visual learners and we all go to the internet now to research and look up companies. We have LinkedIn, everyone has a website. So as an, um, you know, a potential job candidate, um, I go to your website and all I see are, you know, people, everyone looks the same. It's all white males mostly. And then I see one black and brown person, you know, smiling at me. And I think, oh, you know, do I want to work here, right? So how can you change the things internally first, you know, to make some improvements with people that are already there. Um, and then to help, you know, attract uh, diverse candidates. And that doesn't mean change all your pictures to, you know, that's on your website to include black and brown people. Cause we can see right through that. We can see right <laughs> through that. Like we know, um, you know, you have all these stock images of black and brown people, but then we look up, you know, um, who's in leadership, and, it, and it's all, you know, non-black and brown people, right? Or everyone looks the same. There's no diversity. Um, so we can see right through that. So start within and then eliminate those things that we just talked about, you know, the, the, that job description, make sure that the language is welcoming, right? When you start talking about rock star and, you know, someone who is, uh, crazy fast and things like that those are off-putting to some some demographics and groups of people so that and there are tools out there that can evaluate your job description for you and recommend that you use different words and languages to help attract diverse candidates so there are tools and resources out there they do exist you don't have to do this all on your own but you know make your job description welcoming um, having that, um, listing that salary, that's important. That creates equity, right? That lets people know 
that, you know, how much you think this job is valued and that they won't be undercut, you know, um, if they apply because they know they can see that this is the range, right? And then a couple other things, um, having, getting rid of that requirement to list your previous job salary, um, you know, eliminating that even can help because the notion is that you will be judged um, if you make $20,000 less, you know, your current company, then this role um, has a range for, then you automatically think that they're going to judge you and try to put you on the lower end because they're going to say, oh, it's going to be an increase for you anyway, so why do you care? Right, so there are things that you could do, and there are tools and websites out there that can help you do those things. So it's, it, you do not have to recreate the wheel. You just do a little Googling, really. Um, the information is out there. Um, and, and, and riffing off that, so I, I posted in the, uh, the chat, Textio, T-E-X-T-I-O is a great tool for sort of scanning your job description to see if you're using the word ninja a little too much. Um, so there's a couple things here too, right? So one is, uh, think a lot about, and again, this is do the research, think a lot about factors that disproportionately affect black and brown people. So talk about healthcare, right? Think about your um, maternity and your paternity leave, your parental leave policies, right? Think about like your work flexibility, right? I mean, these days it's the rigor that you can work from home, but like think a lot about that, right? Because people may not be as flexible, right? And in disproportionate ways. So those are the, th if you lead with those things, that, that I mean, if I'm, I'm looking <laughs> and someplace wants me to work 80 hours a week and another place is gonna be like, oh yeah, you're gonna get a few months off. Uh, for parental leave, and we're going to be super flexible about you need to go to the doctor or you need to go pay, pay this bill or whatever it is. Okay. All right, makes it way easier for me to decide where I want to be, even if I don't yeah. see a, 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 a Benetton ad on every page of your website. Right. <laughs> um, the other thing, honestly, and this is sort of like flips the question on its head, but recently uh, Will Reynolds over at Sear employed his entire cleaning staff. Right. Most companies, whether big or small, actually their cleaning staff is a third party. They're just about everything actually is third party. Corporate America, like that's how you do it. You just outsource everything except your core responsibilities because staff is expensive. So if you can do it, yeah, of course. But what that ends up doing is those third party companies tend to pay their people not great <laughs> and not really have benefits and all that. So he, like, he, he I, I, I know Will, and we, we'd actually, he, he'd been thinking about this a while, but he said, okay, well, screw it. I can afford this. We're gonna do it. We're gonna like make, are, you know, facilities folks, full-time employees, which means they get all the benefits, right? They get all the health, they get all the unlimited time off, they get all the, like, all the stuff that, you know, Jane the coder is getting, you know, Jane the um, cleaning staff is getting too now, which is a huge difference, right? That is a completely different scenario for that family <laughs> in terms of their ability to have mobility, in terms of their ability to own land, in terms of their ability to pay tax, like, you have changed so much about that person's life <laughs> and frankly changed the demographics of your company pretty quickly because let's be honest, most of that staff is black and brown. And now maybe overnight you've doubled your black and brown staff, <laughs> right? So I'm being only a little bit facetious there, but that makes a difference. Like if we're talking about the project of job creation as a means of economic change and empowerment for black and brown people, we're not just talking about tech. <laughs> we're talking about any job where black and brown people are represented and making sure that job, whether it involves coding or not, is paid fairly and has benefits and has the ability for, mo for mobility. I think that is revolutionary. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it kind of is. Right. That ability for mobility really is a real big one because it's, it's not enough to just hire diverse candidates. Make sure that it's equitable. Right? Are they getting paid the same amount that their teammates or peers are being paid for the same work, right? How can they move up in the company? All those sorts of things, um, their entire trajectory, what does that look like? It's not just hiring a certain amount of people. Um, so take that into consideration too. And I also want to put the onus on the people that are doing the hiring. You know, if you're in a position, if you're a hiring manager, question these things yourself, you know, ask yourself, does this salary, is it, 
equal, you know, to what's going on, you know, with the rest of the company and other people in these positions. Um, take a look at the job description. Do I need this extra ninja or rock star? No, um, there are no ninjas here. You know, <laughs> do you really need that information? So ask and begin to question authority. I think, you know, we're all creatures of habit, right? It's so easy to just do what we've always done. It's always been done this way. But I think now is the time to begin to question that. Question the status quo. Great, thanks so much, Mayada. All right, so we, we really are running a little short on time. I mean, we've already gone over, but we really can't go over at past 4.30. Um, so I'm gonna throw one more question out there. And this one is more for Ashley. Um, so it was posted anonymously. Um, what do you see going on in the tri-college community between Bryn Mawr, Haverford, and Swarthmore colleges that are being addressed to encourage black and brown students in tech and computer science? What do you see from the faculty and staff perspective to employ more by those three colleges? Um, that's a great question. And although we are a trico college, uh, we do have three separate boards. <laughs> and so there is definitely different things happening at all three of them. Um, I know that, you know, Swarthmore takes this really seriously. And there have been conversations being discussed around diversity, equity, inclusion with our students, faculty, and staff. Um, discussion really helps a lot, right? Because it helps create empathy around the situation and we establish empathy with each other, right? So I think that we're in the same position as a lot of people with strategically planning how to move forward. Um, the pandemic shine a light on a lot of disparity, you know, between different students having access to different things in their homes versus on campus. And so we've addressed a lot of those issues, um, trying to just make sure that everyone has what they need in order to teach and learn in this environment. Um, so I think there's, a, there's, you know, a lot taking place between discussion and strategic planning right now. So we are on a journey, the same journey as everyone else trying to figure this out. And I think, you know, with incremental change, we're doing a good job. Great. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, we have about six minutes left. I don't know if Dave, Ashley, you guys had any other final thoughts you kind of want to leave us with. Otherwise, we can go into our little wrap up. But um, we really appreciate all the perspective that you've been able to share today. It's been informative for me as well as a, as a designer at Think Company. I, I think this is a great opportunity that we get to have this conversation. It's really great. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Think Company for creating this platform. This is a platform where black and brown voices are being highlighted. And I encourage everyone else on the call or if you're listening or viewing this at a later time to, you know, create spaces and platforms where black and brown people are diverse people can kind of shape their own narratives and tell their own stories because we need more of that being put out there in order to make change and create change and create this different vision that, you know, that looks like uh, success for us, right? So we need different narratives out there. So continue to create these spaces and these platforms for diverse people. Absolutely, that was so well put. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start wrapping things up in our last five minutes um, and go ahead and share my screen. Just bear with me for a second. Um, it looks like that didn't work. Just a second. <laughs> my screen sharing abilities are top notch, clearly. All right, can you see that? Dave and Ashley, you're saying yes. yes. I believe mm -hmm. in you, okay. Um, so, after this session, we really thank everyone for taking the time to um, be with us. We know we extended this by about a half an hour, so thank you very much for your patience. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email with links to connect with Ashley and Dave. Um, and also, we'd love to have your feedback about this webinar. You can fill out this two-minute survey that I believe we are dropping in the chat. And remember that we have these upcoming webinars and workshops, um, service design for voting, modernizing a platform to dem democratize data, and inclusive design, creating a bias-informed organization by Dave, who you heard from today. 
Um, so thank you all for coming to this webinar. It was a great time. Thanks, Dave and Ashley, so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.